Welcome to another episode of Anglican Unscripted. This is episode 865. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. Today's June 28th, 2024. All right, we're here, you're here, it's time for another show. There's lots of exciting news because we've had a general convention for the Episcopal Church, we've had a uh, provincial assembly for the uh, ACNA folks, and there's lots of news to report. Yes, we talked about the new uh, person in charge now of the ACNA, but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, George, uh, we get to talk about locations. I'm here in Idaho Falls uh, in the parking lot of the Idaho Potato Museum. You're like, well, what's that? Well, <laughs> Idaho's known for its potatoes, and lo and behold, they have a museum dedicated to it where you get to park your, your RV free overnight for one night. So we're taking advantage of that before we head off to Yellowstone this week. How you doing? I, I, I'm i watching the weather forecast. It looks like it's a little humid in Florida. Very hot, very humid. It's sort of what I call tiring weather, that uh, you uh, step outside and you uh just it's, immediately wilt it it's, sucks uh, the life out of you <laughs> yes yeah. well, i mean my watch right now says here in idaho the uh humidity percentage is uh currently 14 percent uh where if i were in, in florida it would have a nine something after that so uh different worlds in, in one little country um but how you doing george you've certainly recovered a little bit from your your busy month very tired, uh, very tired. As, as some have known, my, my wife has been ill. Uh, after uh, seven weeks of hospitalization, she came home this week, and we're transitioning to uh, outpatient care. And um, I'm at that point where when the crisis is passed, that's sort of when you go, oh, and sort of collapse because you no longer have to hold fast uh and uh be prepared for any new new worry so things are in moving in the right direction but i'm now exhausted and it's starting to catch up with me yeah, i mean well it is it's a mentally exhausting uh procedure we, we've gone through one percent of what george and his family's gone through and we're mentally exhausted as you know that uh, my dear wife lost her job uh for a defense contractor uh she's easily picked up i think we're, we're up to offer five but that's very difficult for my wife because she doesn't like to make choices between five different things she like just two clear-cut decisions she'd have to choose so um Will the RV life continue? Yes, these are remote jobs and uh, jobs that she would love. But my wife likes to choose between two things, not five things. So her stress level's up. She She's waiting for this to be over. Your stress level's still up. But most of all, we want to thank our Anglican Unscripted community for praying for us. It's really helped. I mean, this is, you know, we are on the cutting edge of telling you what's going on in the church and uh therefore we're up for uh, satan's scrutiny and uh he hit he is he's not taking any time off on, on dealing with uh, kevin and george and we do really appreciate your prayers george let's move on here to the news uh this is going to be episode 865 and the first uh, thing you sent me is general convention there is a new presiding bishop of the episcopal church we are losers george Okay, I, I don't know what's wrong with us, but uh, you and I were going with DEI picks here. Um, and if you remember back when uh, Jeffrey Shorey was uh, chosen to be the presiding bishop, uh, we were in the press room, Steve Waring, George Conger, Peter Frank, and a couple other people had a little pool going. And who was going to win uh, that election? I didn't really know her, so I picked Jeffrey Shorey. And I won. I won the pool. And I'm like, oh, great. I won the pool. Who's, Je who's Jeffrey Shorey? Who is Roe? Who is Sean Roe? I've never heard of this guy. So, new presiding bishop is Sean Roe. Let's talk about him. Sean Roe is uh, 49 years old. He's the youngest presiding bishop since the first presiding bishop, William White. He's been bishop of northwestern Pennsylvania, which is Erie, the Erie and Shenango Valley area of Pennsylvania, uh, for the last, uh, I believe, he became a bishop at the age of 32. He was the youngest Episcopal bishop at the time. And 
he has subsequently picked up uh, the oversight of Western New York and the Diocese of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. Now, these are all tiny, tiny dioceses, but essentially the size of our de my deanery mm -hmm. uh, here. But Rowe has uh, carved a particular niche for himself within the life of the Episcopal Church. As a deputy to general convention, he was on the, House, on the Rules Committee. And as a member of the House of Bishops, he has been the House Parliamentarian. He has a reputation as a technocrat, somebody who uh, can get the papers shuffled and the forms filled out and the jobs done. I was banking on a D. Uh, we had three DEI choices and a balding, fat white man and a, a uh, thinner uh, balding white man. And the balding, fat white man won. And he won on the first ballot, which and he won overwhelmingly. The uh, uh, DEI picks just didn't gel with anybody. Now, you can basically pick individual reasons here or there, but in talking after the fact, there's a sense that they wanted a safe pair of hands. Sean Rowe's not charismatic. He's not a preacher. He's not another Michael Curry who's entertaining on stage. He is a regional manager. Uh, he, 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 he could be a character from the TV show The Office in Scranton, oh, no, Pennsylvania. I mean, he, he is middle management. And I think, you know, he's middle management. And he is somebody the bishops need not be fearful about. Mm -hmm. Catherine Jeffrey Shorey was an ideologue, and she had no problem disposing of her opponents in the middle of the night. Uh, Michael Curry um, really did pound the race drum, and so long as you kept clear of that uh, beating, um, you had no problems. Sean Rowe doesn't have any drums to beat, other than the smooth administration of the machinery. So in this, in that sense, this is a very good pick because he's not going to make any silly statements like uh, Catherine Jeffrey Shorey made, but at the same time, he's not going to make any grand gestures like marrying Meghan Markle to Prince Harry that uh, Michael Curry made. He's just a safe pair of hands. Now, he only serves a nine-year term so he will be retiring at the age of 58, poor fellow, because there's no place that's, to go after that. That's my age. <laughs> I have no place to go. Now, I mean, it is interesting because we had certainly thought uh, at least the, trans the trajectory of the Episcopal Church for the last uh, two dozen years that they would never pick another white man. And, whoa, mm -hmm. whoa here we go. So... Interesting. Well, the uh, I'm going to jump to the last line in our uh, our paragraph. We're seeing a definite split, and Dan Martins, the retired bishop of Springfield, Illinois, on uh, a Twitter or I think it was Twitter or Facebook, wrote that idiot. we're seeing a definite seeing a definite split where the bishops have basically adopted a big tent liberalism. We, let's all try to get along. I'll tolerate you, you tolerate me. Mm -hmm. And we got, have to make this thing work because everything is falling around about us. Money is short, attendance is down. We realize all these problems are taking place. The deputies, meanwhile, are still in the grips of the liberal ideologues who are still engaged in cancel culture. And it's the bishops who elect the presiding bishop. Now, if it had been left to the deputies, we would have had a very different choice. Yes. <laughs> so we're, we're, we're seeing that. And now Julia Harris, who uh, her, her maiden name is Ayala. She is a uh, first generation American of Mexican origin. Mm -hmm. She was reelected vice president of the House of Deputies. And here's the interest. She was elected before Sean Rowe was elected. And the interesting thing was that she was attacked by her vice president for being incompetent DEI choice. And uh, a fierce uh, campaign was mounted against her, against Harris. And there was a black candidate and the American Indian who was the vice president. The black candidate gained more votes than the American Indian, but still Harris was strongly reelected. And if you want to play the DEI game, 
they have their token. Now they need somebody to actually make the church work. Uh, I hate to put it in those stark of a terms, mm -hmm. but Harris was attacked by her own staffers as being incompetent. And for the vice president, they replaced the American Indian woman with a bland white priest from the Diocese of Kentucky, another functionary. So we've gone uh, from uh, a woman vice president, a woman president, and a black president of the, of the bishops to a middle-aged white man uh, and another middle-aged white man replacing a, a black man and a white woman, uh, an American Indian woman. These are DEI fiascos, if you will. It's not supposed to work this way. Well, kind of the, the decade of let's try something new is over. You know, they, they tried all these new things and innovative approaches, and um, but that only is at the personal level. To try something new in the policy and theology level is still alive and well. They're going to continue on uh, towards the course of adding same-sex rights to the prayer book, George. Yeah, Resolution A116 passed its first reading. Uh, at the last general convention, they, they came up with trial rights for general neutral marriage, and this was adopted. It'll take another general convention to make it official policy. But after the 2020 convention, the prayer book uh, marriage rights will be changed. The current right will be called right one, and then this trial liturgy will now be the new right two. And the trial liturgy will basically substitute this man and this woman for these persons. So it can be used for a same sex couple. It can be used for an opposite sex couple. It's just gender neutral. So that's sort of the fig leaf that they're coming under that we're not really promoting gay marriage. We're promoting gender neutral marriage. Yeah, well, you know, walks like a duck, quacks like a duck, it's a duck. <laughs> and the they also adopted a resolution A092, which was a rejiggering of the discrimination forms. You cannot discriminate against people for race, sex, color, gender, national origin, all this, that, and the other. And they've sort of broadened it to say that bishops cannot be brought up on charges if they are unable to uh, ordain a person who holds an opposite view of the same sex marriage. And that they then must invite another bishop to provide access to the sermon process for ordination. So in Central Florida, that would mean if you have somebody who is gay and holds different views on that, they would be shipped to Miami. And if Miami had some, and if Miami had somebody who uh, was vociferously opposed to gay marriage, they'd be shipped to Orlando. So the that second part about. doesn't happen. <laughs> Just the first part happens. <laughs> well, we'll see. But the hard left did get their pound of flesh. The bishops wanted a specific statement saying that uh, those who believe that marriage is between a man and a woman would not be in violation of their ordination vows or the Title IV proceedings, which require uh, being nice to gay people. Now, that was defeated by the deputies uh, on a vote by orders. They really wanted to kill this thing. And the, uh, it doesn't say that you will now be persecuted, but the language that would forbid you for being persecuted. So I don't know how this is going to play out, but we still are, as you know, Dan Martin says, we, the war is between the various factions of the left, the hard left and the center left. The center left are the more pragmatics, they're the bishops, they have to run these places. Whereas the deputies get to show up, swan around, and there's usually single issue people who get elected on, you know, support me and I'll make sure that uh, we get this issue uh, done. So the reality of life is that bishops run the show. It's an Episcopal church. And uh, so the bishops usually get what they want, either in canons or in practice. Mm -hmm. But it's still not clean and still far from satisfactory. No, and if you're asking me, the Titanic is still sinking. Uh, if you, especially if you want to do the, the tale of two churches. Uh, the General mm -hmm. Convention happened in the Episcopal Church this week. ACNA had their Anglican Provincial Assembly this week. And there's a contrast. And, you know, mm -hmm. it, as a journalist, I step back and say, you know, 
this contrast is very visible because one church is talking about its growth, is talking about uh, how things are still you know, in the upper swing, and, and yes, we're still dealing with some elephants in the room, but we're, we're still willing to do that as a church. Nobody, nobody's getting fired for this elephant in the room. And I think we should talk about the ACNA here. Uh, I, I want to apologize for being in a hostile recording environment, but I'm also in a, a train depot. But George, General Assembly, growth in attendance, what happened there? Well, the ACNA added 36 congregations to a total of 1,013 at the end of 2023. And that's, uh, and their membership grew by over 3,000 people to about 128,000, and attendance grew by 9,000, up 12% to a total of 84,000. Now, of these, so across the board increases, and only four dioceses of the 29 reported decreases in attendance. Now, half of the growth in congregations, and a good chunk of this growth came from the absorb absorption of Felix Orgy's diocese, uh, all nations. But still, you have overall strong growth. Um, the largest diocese in terms of membership is still South Carolina with over 17,000 people, though they did record a decline uh, in, in uh, attendance, whereas the largest diocese in terms of attendance is C4SO with over 8,000 people on a Sunday. So um, we are seeing a strong, positive growth. Now, uh, Jeff Walton, you're going to be doing a special show with. He can sort of do a deeper dive into these numbers. But uh, Kevin, you're quite right. There's a stark contrast between an Episcopal church that has spots of growth, whereas ACNA has spots of decline, where the majority are growing. Here are the Episcopal church, the majority are declining. All right, I'm going to warn you right now, there's a train coming, but let's talk about Archbishop Steve Wood. He's being pressed on the C4SO issue, women's orders, and a bunch of other stuff. Yeah, he's getting beaten up from the what I would call the right. He's be getting beaten up because you got to do something about the wacky, wacky people at C4SO, because every month it seems we've got another little scandal going on. Well, when you have a diocese of 8,000 plus people, on Sunday, you're going to have some oddballs. So there's, you know, no crime in that. But there is a there's a desire for uniformity, both liturgical and theological, uh, in some quarters of the ACNA. And there, he and Steve Wood is being pressed on that. He's also being pressed on the women's issue. Um, is the question of headship? Is it tradition? Is it scriptural? Is it biblical? And he's, as we mentioned last week, he's not been given a honeymoon. Now, he is uh, being scheduled such that he only had four hours, quote, free this week to talk to anybody, uh, which is a big break from uh, Bob Duncan and Foley Beach. So either his handlers don't trust him to say the right things, or they're frightened by the current environment and they want to hide Steve Wood from any possible misstatements or missteps. I think they want to give him a honeymoon. I mean, in reality, uh, do you have to sit in front of a hostile press corps uh, your first day on the job? Of course not. Uh, and Steve Wood hasn't done anything as Archbishop right now that is going to uh, bring about a press corps that says, ha, we knew you would do that. Ha, we knew you, you were pro this or anti this. And he deserves a little bit of a honeymoon, except for what, uh, uh, <laughs> except for the, the paper he co-authored uh, regarding George Floyd. That that's, that's something we'll get to talk about. And, to, and he's still not even Archbishop. That happens later today. Today's Friday. Yeah. Uh, they're load, uh, coupling freight cars next <laughs> right to here, next to me. <laughs> I, I'm in a, at a train yard, and apparently at 10:45 in the morning, you attach all the cars. And I've been watching it happen. I've been trying to mute the mic at the right time, so you didn't get to hear it. But you just heard the big slam of uh, a, a train, a freight engine hitting the uh, the cars. I'm sorry for that. 
Uh, you know, the part of this lifestyle is recording where you can. And some of you guys love it. Oh, that's the American heritage out there, Kevin. Good job. People like Kevin who want a, a, a Sampu studio are annoyed by it. But, and back to, to Steve Wood, uh, he get as far as I'm concerned, he gets a little bit of honeymoon. But if you said something in the past, you, you need to be able to defend that. And some things, uh, just based on statistics, uh, are hard to defend and would like to hear his, his update on, on some of those thoughts. Uh, all the bishops who co-authored that uh, need need to address it, but that's just Kevin. What else we got here on the the, the, the trades going? Brr, 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 brr. Um, Foley Beach. Well, one, thing, one, uh, you, you, oh, one thing interesting, Foley Beach is saying his goodbyes, and uh, I think it was asked by somebody about these online petitions that are circulating against women clergy, and he said something very interesting. He said, well, they weren't addressed to me, so I haven't really done anything about them. <laughs> hey, good point. So if you write with the petitions, <laughs> make sure you address it to somebody who can do something about it, because otherwise it's, oh, is it out there? That's nice. Nothing to do with me. Hey, my, and I'm not retired yet, but my last six months of retirement, as I'm, I'm going into retirement, there's stuff that's going to cross my desk that I'm not, yeah, whatever, go on. Yeah, not, not that important. I'll let the next guy handle it. And yeah. Uh, Foley Beach had next guy itis, and he, he takes right now it's a uh, 1245 uh, over in Latrobe. Uh, the service is going on as the uh, transfer uh, authority from Archbishop Foley Beach to uh, Archbishop elect now Archbishop Steve Wood. I want to congratulate both of them. Uh, I'm going back here. Uh, the Alliance, you want to talk about that? So we're moving off from the uh, General Convention and the ACNA Assembly to the Alliance. This is overseas. This is Church of England stuff, George. Uh, we got press releases saying uh, that if the Church of England continues on the path of LLF, it will necessitate the creation of a parallel province to the Church of England for conservatives. What? Somebody's up their game. There's now a line in the sand. Finally. You know, Wednesday night, uh, this week, we late in the evening, we received uh, an email with the letter to the archbishops from the Alliance, which is a coalition of groups and individuals uh, on the conservative side of the Church of England. And prominent people from the Holy Trinity Fellowship, members of General Synod, some archdeacons, New Wine, so on and so forth. These are not uh, an online petition group. These are movers and shakers within the Church of England. And they said, if uh, I'm encapsulating, you can read the uh, document itself on uh, Anglican Inc. We posted it. Um, and it was sent to us because uh, several members of the Alliance are, are viewers and mm -hmm. they wanted this to be circulated as widely as possible and not circulated through the uh filter of uh of uh, you know the liberal you know the church times or somebody else well, whatever it was given to us the one it was given to everybody else and we put it out there and this letter is saying that if the general synod goes ahead with llf's same-sex blessings this will necessitate or compel or mandate the creation of a parallel province within the Church of England. This is the strongest statement yet from the most influential people yet that uh, if you, this is the line in the sand, gay blessings. If you cross this line, we're not walking out of the Church of England, but we're walking out of the provinces of Canterbury and York and of our, of our diocese and we're going to need new dioceses, new bishops, and a new province for those of us who not cannot in good conscience follow you uh, to hell. Uh. Well, I mean, but that's that's an interesting point because we're always going to say, when is somebody going to uh, put their head up and say, enough? You know, they've been complaining about this for a long time, and there have been alternatives for them to join. You could join the, the, the Free Church. You could... Uh, um, joined uh, the uh, GAFCON Europe. There's other things you could do. However, uh, and as such, there's just no real big interest in that. They're like, yeah, but that's not English enough for us. We want to do something that has an English tinge to it and forming another province is clearly that because they, some many, almost, you know, 400 years ago, they 
what they did Canterbury and York. It's not the first time they they did alternate provinces, George. Yeah, well, that goes back to the early, the early Middle Ages. Uh, yeah, fifteen. Um, yeah, let's up. Anglo Anglo Saxon Church. So, um, will this? I can. I'm fairly confident that when Justin Welby got this, this ruined his breakfast when he read it that morning. Fairly confident he does not want this, mm. and. I believe this will be a telling blow because there are bishops uh, who, if this happens, then their diocese will lose essentially all of its children and all of its growing parishes. They'll be left with the uh, central administration and the dying, the dying churches that need support. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's some bishops who just do not want to fight that fight. Now there are some are who want to fight and will take no no for an answer, but uh, you know this is just, this is a strong strong smack, and it may very well uh, derail things. And if they go through with same sex blessings, then it will provide the answer that many people in the Church of England have been hoping and waiting for, but the bishops have not wanted to. Uh, lose their authority mm -hmm. and uh, give the, the freedom of conscience to people. Well, and that's the cool thing. There's always, uh, in movements across the church, there's always been that line in the sand moment. And, and you always wait for it to occur. For the Episcopal Church um, uh, and its slow departure from reality, uh, there was nobody really willing to stand up who had any clout that would say this is the line in the sand that will split the church uh mm -hmm. you know and so i i'm glad to finally read this uh, and we'll have to see what happens over time yeah i i hope well be right now it's like ooh, whoa wait a minute this is worse than being sued by the the uh the alpha guy so we'll see well I, actually the alpha guy uh nikki gumbel is mm -hmm. one of the people behind yeah. this and this is uh this is the, the the threats from the HTB network being put into practical action. Good. All right. The Society, the Anglo Catholic group, is going soft on the gay issue. I know that that's not exactly news. But no, that's I was going to say, you know, I mean, uh, without rolling my eyeball a little bit here, um, yeah, they are because they have internal issues dealing with this. Yeah, they put out a statement about the forthcoming LLF, and they conceded that they have some members who are pro-gay. And basically, they say nothing of any consequence other than, ooh, ooh, ah, ee, ooh, mush, mush, mush. And the, the formation of the, this is an opinion now, it's not a fact, but my opinion is that the formation of the ordinary at really devastated the Anglo-Catholic wing of the Church of England yeah. because the very strong-minded, strong-willed, rigorous Anglo-Catholics, some of them left to join the Roman Catholic Church under the banner of the Ordinariate. Not all of them left, but those that remained, especially those in Episcopal office, are squishes, are weak, are wishy-washy, are, you know, just just what they are and that's George's opinion don't sue us for that okay all right the society did that Church of England Evangelical Council is fighting hard for visible distinction in structures and leadership yeah they uh, while the society's been weak the CEEC has been strong yeah. now people have been saying what they're fighting for is never going to happen which is visible distinctive separation well this recent letter uh, helps them tremendously in their battle. Now, 11 conservative bishops also penned a letter this week, which we published on Anglican Inc. And they go a long way in supporting the CEEC's views and the Alliance's views, but they stop short. Just like a good bishop, they you can infer and they imply, but they don't actually say. So there is a strong nucleus there that is not going to go along to get along with Justin Welby and his uh, agenda to remake the church in the modern uh, cool Britannia image that they've been fostering for a generation. 
good line. <laughs> you know, sometimes George's lines end up in the titles because, uh, uh, well, we'll talk. Okay, so from time to time, not very often, we talk about politics. When Brexit uh, made its vote, we, we, we talked about Brexit. Uh, and something newsworthy happened last night in politics and this morning in, in U.S. Supreme Court politics that bears our attention. Um, not because uh, we don't have presidential elections or not because we've never had a presidential debate before, but because of, in this day and age, the ability to hide one's senility um, in the day and age of video and and honest reporting and stuff like that, it it, it occurs to me that uh, somebody needs to be sued. Uh, and it starts with Jill Biden. But l let's talk a little bit about the uh, debate last night. Um, two people, both uh, well over the age of what I think is a healthy president, uh, got to the podium and uh, were speaking. And the guy on the right was clearly uh, suffering the, the effects of age of being aged, George. There's only three years that separate. Joe Biden from Donald Trump in age, but it might as well have been 30 years. Yeah. Um, and the uh, reaction that has been fair and not, not universal is that uh, Joe Biden really isn't up to it. And it's, I don't think the issues they discuss were very important. I don't think that, well, they are important, but I don't think that's what America took away. What America took away is looking, can this man uh, lead and I think many Americans came away with he's not he should be in a nursing home he shouldn't be in the Oval Office and and we saw immediately on the various liberal networks and outlets the people saying we need to dump Biden we need to you know go to plan B we're going to lose the House the Senate the Congress you know and the presidency if we continue along this path. Now, you had a little post on Facebook say the big winner last night was Gavin Newsom, but I don't think so. I think the Democrats will take it as a grain of salt. I was wrong about the elections in the Episcopal <laughs> Church. You know, probably we wrong about this. We don't know nothing. Why do people I, watch I this think show? DEI, <laughs> I think DEI is so heavily integrated into the Democratic Party's mindset that they cannot dump a black woman for a white man no matter how slick Gavin Newsom might be and how attractive and how photogenic, they can't get rid of Kamala Harris. Oh, I disagree uh, completely. Uh, no, nobody wants her. Uh, d even today, nobody's calling for, okay, I saw one little article that said, it's time for, for 15 or 25. You know, pull out uh, Amendment 25 and get rid of him. But I don't think she has any support. Whenever you watch an interview, you see, you know, she clearly has a, a, a mania in response. Her, her response to uh, questions are usually laughter or uncomfortable, uh, re, you know, uh, giggles and stuff like that. She's, she's not up for the job. Biden isn't either. I don't know about Trump, but uh, I have, you, I knew last night after watching the debate why he picked Camilla to be the vice president. Okay, she's not going to consider. They would consider uh, Michelle Obama long before they would consider uh, Miss Harris, Mrs. Harris. So, well, uh, at the end of the day, there's only one person who's going to make that decision. It's Joe Biden, and if Joe Biden thinks he can do it, he's going to do it. He's sure. shown to be very stubborn, very, uh, and for him at this stage to basically concede that Donald Trump is right, I think he'd rather be dead. Sure. I just, I, I just, I can see all of the logic of all the politicians making all these different claims about now we need to do this, or that, and the other. But it's all contingent upon one man's view, and if this man thinks he's up for the fight, nobody can convince him otherwise. Yeah, well, he would be much better off if he had refused to do the debate. Now he's signed up for a second debate, uh, or he wants to sign up for a second debate. And it just harkens back to like 1984, the party that told you to not believe your eyes and ears uh, um, mm -hmm. and, and what you see. That was their, their final command. Don't, 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 don't look at any of this. Um, ignore the wizard behind the curtain. 
and uh, we're here. This is it's unbelievable that we're, we're f- that in a nation. Oh, here comes the train. In a nation with you know more than three hundred million people, uh, we get the delight of the entertainment uh, we deserve. This, this is karma. This is this is in, in my my term karma, George. I'm going, to, I'm going to mute you, you. You you talk for twenty seconds while I mute the the, the, the microphone here. The, the U.S. Supreme Court, I'm fairly confident, held withheld two decisions until after the debate, so as not to give Donald Trump a club with which to beat Joe Biden last night. The first is that they threw out the main uh, club used by the Department of Justice to jail 350 January 6th protesters saying that this uh, this this interfering with government uh, law that they came up with to prosecute people that was improper so we're going to so in essence uh, the only things they were guilty of were misdemeanor trespass so we're going to see all I assume we're going to see uh, with this Supreme Court decision all these people uh, are going to be let out of jail or um, if Donald Trump is elected he'll pardon them anyway but even if uh, Joe Biden is reelected, uh, they're going to be leaving at jail and they're not going to be any more of these uh, heavy handed prosecutions. So that was a major win uh, for those who invested in this issue, in this area, civil liberties. Another but even issue more important. Yeah, is the Chevron. I mean, one of the things that has been very infuriating as an American is having groups like the EPA, uh, the ATF, uh, all these little, you know, demogra- uh, kingdoms of their own, make laws uh, that were never approved by the, the Senate or the, uh, passed by the the House, uh, the way th- the bills should be passed in this country. And so with the ATF, the, uh, uh, the local arms enforcement here at the federal level uh, would make rules about guns. You can't have a gun that has a bump stock on it. How dare you? Or the EPA says, you can't collect rainwater. We're going to put you in jail if you collect rainwater. And the U.S. Supreme Court decided, hey, we need to deal with this. What's the new rule now, George? Well, there had been a government doctrine, the Chevron Doctrine, where agencies can interpret and take rules to their logical consequences Mm -hmm. within certain parameters. That was overturned. And now agencies may only... uh, enforce rules created and authorized by Congress within the clear meaning of the statute. Mm -hmm. So as you say, the ATF coming up with a creative way to restrict arms and guns, um, that's now illegal. Uh, The Bureau of Land Management uh, cannot decide unilaterally to withhold water from Idaho farmers because of a snail darter, uh, you know, because the uh, EPA has said that this uh, fish is, you know, Congress is the decision maker. Mm -hmm. Congress, not bureaucrats. And this is a major change and is, uh, well, I think it will be a boon for our country. It's the biggest um, swipe against modern liberalism at a legislative level, probably in the last 80 or 90 years here in America. Um, they've slowly said, well, this will never get through Congress. Why don't we create a entity, the EPA or the uh, ATF, that would have legal rights over uh, U.S. citizens? And that was wiped out in one swift blow by the Supreme Court uh, this morning, which is great. Now, yeah, why did they withhold it till after the, uh, the debate? You know, it, oh, because uh, Donald Trump would have uh, used that as a club with which to beat Joe Biden, because right. Joe Biden, you know, on the gen- on January sixth, this is directly against everything yeah. that Joe Biden was saying about an insurrection, this and that. Now, you know, it's nonsense. Yeah. And second, the administrative state is one of the you know Joe Biden is trying to impose these uh, restrictions on you know oil drilling and you know pollution and all this and that just by fiat. And the Supreme Court said you can't do that unless Congress says you can do it. You can't do it. So both of these things would have been, uh, you know, gifts to Donald Trump, and uh, 
uh, maybe they just held them until after the debate so as not to beat Joe Biden up too badly. Yeah. Well, you do have to look at it as, as far as um, we elect a president to lead us into the future. Joe Biden was elected president, and he decided the future would be electricity, that we'd all have EV cars. Um, he decided the future would be uh, abortion by pill. He decided, you know, there's many things that he made decisions on um, that that leadership style can no longer exist, uh, according to the Supreme Court. That if you want to make laws, you go to the Senate and you pass it through the House. You know. Kevin, you remember when we were children yeah. on the Bill, Saturday Bill on the cartoon? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, they had these little cartoons that uh, with with uh, catchy to ca catchy music about how Congress worked, and uh, uh, that's basically what we're returning to. Rather than the current log rolling and administrative state, we're going back to a legislative state. We've talked in the past a little bit about uh, politics over in England. Uh, any uh, keen ideas about their upcoming election? Well, uh, we had some very entertaining. Uh, uh, comments uh, and some people take great offense that I'm entertained by Nigel Farage and the whole show. Some people would rather rather uh, walk across hot coals and have him as prime minister in the government or anything. As I say, I I uh, I just am entertained. It's neat. Uh, He's yeah, the he Nigel. It, yeah, Nigel is the English version of Trump. He's not a millionaire or anything like that, but he's willing to be bombastic uh, with reason. And mm -hmm. um, Trump is too. Uh, I have other qualms with Trump, but uh, I like that Trump is willing to stand up for things that he believes in. Uh, he's wishy-washy on some really important issues, um, but it's not somebody who's fighting against me tooth and nail like the current uh, president and his... Uh, uh, minions so to speak so interesting george all right we've come up on 42 minutes i we need to cut the show short here because i'm going to do a quick interview with jeff walton he was uh on site at latrobe and got lots of good important information maybe some insider information about the election that we can uh, show with you so stick t stay tuned for uh, anglican unscripted three you know, eight sixty Six. This six, is eight six, six yeah, yeah. I'm having a George moment. Oh my goodness. I'm Kevin Carlson. And I'm George Conger. And you've been watching Anglican Unscripted episode 865.